Tell us what we're seeing here. I mean, to me, I think I see mountains. I think maybe I see water. What is the story in here? Well, this is a story. Many years ago, Aboriginal people have a belief that they come from an island called Makassar, off Indonesia, because they saw the first sailing ships coming in two or three hundred years before any European people arrived in Australia, and they were trading for trepang, a highly priced sea slug. And so the, they came inland and they started talking to Aboriginal people. And then they left about 1908. They were actually stopped by the government authorities. But Aboriginal people believed that Luma Luma, the giant, stopped them. He was a very important man because he taught them all the ceremony about Marayan, which is a grading ceremony for young boys, where they do all the body cuts on their body. The first woman in Arnhem Land was Yingana. She's the mother of all living things. And she came from a long way overseas called Makassar too. And she started giving birth to babies. And they grew up and they were half human, half animal. And she grew to dislike them, so she swallowed them all. And then she regurgitated them up nine months later and they're all normal people. And they started walking around the landscape and creating things. There wasn't much of a landscape because it was all flat then. Right. This is people. This is stories that so, Aboriginal so, so people tell me. So, what are the what I call now? These are, these are the mountains. This is Nimbawa. It's called. It's the highest mountain in Western Arnhem Land. It rises up about one and a half thousand feet out of a flat landscape. Mm -hmm. There's a few little boulders around it. These people walked around, create created ceremonies. You can see the ceremonial bags here. Maybe you've got feathers hanging from them. They created all special places, including the rivers. And when they died, they were changed into rocks, and they're rocks forever now. And they're all the rocks, and all their cousins became all the boulders below the mountains. This so again the is awfully like a lot of Maori legends Absolutely. and the legends of the mountains here and yes. their representation as of gods. Yep, yep, yep. And now when the wet season comes to Western Arnhem Land, the thunder starts howling around, the lightning flashes. That lightning is the mountains communicating with each mm. other, talking all the gossip stuff, mm. you know, what's been happening sort mm. of last year and who come through on their Toyota mm. last week, etc., etc. Et Maybe the mountains might gossip about who's been marking their rock with hand stencils. But the use of hand stencils is ancient and widespread throughout Australia. They symbolise the bond between the artist's hand and his affinity with the particular place. Today, of course, we'd spray paint a stenciled image, and in a very real sense, we haven't changed things greatly, though the spray painting of the ancients had a certain flair we've all but lost. You ready? While many artists continue to work in traditional styles, others tell their dreamings in styles all their own. This is a painting I did um, based on one of our traditional stories. Right. And this one is about the red-winged parrot. At home they, got, they call them king parrots. In our stories, in our tribe, um, one of the stories is about the parrot. And while the parrot got a little dash of red on him, and it's it's a it's called Maridi dreaming. Maridi is the parrot, right. and Maridi Lila, I should say. Lila is just another dream is another word for Lila. And in the story, the parrots, all the birds got together and they were having a meeting one day, and they they was talking about the fire that the crocodile had. And the crocodile was living it up and it used to be warm every winter and they used to have to be cold. And so one day they had a meeting and and the parrot said, all right, well, we'll go and we'll be the ones who go to the crocodile nest and, and snap the, crocod the fire, the fire stick of the, cro the crocodile. So one day after the meeting, all the parrots made a plan and then they, they said one night when it was dark or oh, this is the night they said let's go now to that crocodile's nest so they went and they crept up on him they they swooped down and they took the fire stick while the crocodile was asleep he tried to chase them but he couldn't because they flew away and they flew to the trees and 
on the way the wind lit the fire yeah, and they got burnt and that's why they got a little the red on their on their feathers but in la la the in the dreaming animals are people and not all the stories relate to ancient myths. Many artists are also exploring contemporary themes, often of social and political injustice or environmental disaster. What this is, is the campsites at Maralinga in South Australia. This is one campsite, this is the road leading from it to another campsite, and this stretches over about 100 square kilometres in area. So it's an aerial map right. looking on, on straight onto it. And what the artist has done here is just paint all the landscape just there in the white. And that represents after, as the rain season come along and the rain has settled on the ground. And so it's just all white, just there. And afterwards, he has painted glue in a certain area of the painting. He got sand from his country. And it's slightly radioactive, this sand, because it's from Maralinga where the atomic test was in South Australia, and just dropped it on the country. The artist was adopted about two weeks old and raised by white people in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And for years he worked with animals at Taronga Park Zoo and various other places. And he always wanted to paint about the devastation mm -hmm. of the atomic test and the effects upon his people. And he started painting this. His grandparents died as a result of radiation from the atomic test. So that's why he felt so, so strongly about it. So it's a it. comment by him. Mm. And in fact the obliteration though it is a simple obliteration, mm. is more important than the artwork beneath. Absolutely. That's, that's, he said, this is the test and this is what happened, this is the explosion. Right. And now it's land that they can't live on now for another 2,000 years. It's all been cleaned up and the British government gave money to clean it all up. And it's been done, but they, it's no good country. They, they don't want to go back there. Many decades of poverty and displacement from their land, families and traditions almost destroyed Aboriginal art and culture. But after a long dry period, it's blossoming, like desert plants after rain. Now these powerful images are exciting worldwide interest, bringing much needed cash to remote Australian communities, as well as new challenges. Do Indigenous artists in Australia now have a profile? I mean, they, they do it for their own sake and their own culture and their own interests, but are they marketable now? Oh, very much marketable. Uh, I think it's worth $700 million now, the Aboriginal art industry in Australia. And just recently, one of the noted Aboriginal artists, Rover Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, who was represented at the Biennale, he went across there and then he was promoted by the right people, of course, too, to mm -hmm. sort of build him up. His last painting fetched $700,000 at auction at Sotheby's. So mm -hmm. it just shows you from when I was working with Rover in his early days, the paintings were around $500. And it sort of crept up in about 12 years to that marketplace. That's not all of them. This was an exceptional painting bought by the Australian National Gallery, which is a beautiful work. What is the effect on Indigenous art when the rest of the world discovers it and puts a value that is more than a spiritual value on it. There is pressure on people and I've noticed an influx of really good artists going into the communities and working as art advisors in the communities mm -hmm. and I've noticed a lot of the soul and spirit is disappearing from a lot of the paintings now. It's not what it used to be but unfortunately that's the way it is. And the, but is that the motivation of the artist has changed? The motivation is because they have many western things that they have to pay for now. They have Toyotas to put petrol in, they have cassette radios, they have everything else. Uh, the trappings of European society I'm afraid and, and uh, why shouldn't they have all these things? I mean who am I to deny that? But uh, traditionally these paintings were done for a religious purpose for ceremonies. Now they're painted for a marketplace. Oh.